Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is David Penn. I'm a research analyst with the Finnovate Group. And joining me today is Gaila Boscovich. She is a speaker, editorialist, founder of Femtech Global, and head of Europe for Financial Data and Technology Association. We're going to talk a little bit about personalization and banking, challenger banking, and privacy tech, which might be the new hot thing coming in 2020. So, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, David. Happy to be here. Great. So first, let's talk about some of the things you were doing yesterday. Um, I know you were on stage for uh, two main stage offerings. Uh, one of them was a conversation with uh, George Hauer on personalization and banking? Yes, from N26. Okay, how did uh, that go? It's interesting mm -hmm. as a concept when you're building a bank that really is a platform, uh, platform application, full digital stack, brand new, the mm -hmm. whole thing. But thinking about how you can address the market that is with products that are not typical or standard or highly, highly personal. Mm. And with the amount of data that we're collecting and new data analysis techniques, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I think the question is how do you scale that? And mm. when we're talking about you know grand, big markets, the challenge is how do you use or apply technology that allows you then to slice and dice a product that's supposed to have a standard template and a standard mm -hmm. process and compliance um, framework around it mm -hmm. for the end customer and slightly adjust that according to their particular need. I think scale is the bigger question and it's probably mm -hmm. one of the, the biggest challenges that any institution will have irrespective of being new or old. Um, but personalization is the ideal end game. Sure. Whether or not it's actually feasible is a very different matter, especially when we're talking about the lack of financial inclusion. How much more hyper-personalized do we need mm -hmm. to be for those already in the system when we have a bigger problem, which yeah. is the lack, of, the lack of inclusion? That's really interesting. I've not heard anybody put those two together, but it's, it's, once you see them together, it's really quite a compelling really part. In my mind, it's like, do you have baseline financial service access across the board? Right rather than hyper-personalization, which to a certain extent actually mirrors what we're doing with high, high net worth individuals. Mm. So this actually also creates a massive delivery gap in terms of market size, actual markets that you're serving. Right. So I think it's a very different um, philosophical question rather than a technological delivery execution question. Mm -hmm. And the value of hyper-personalization versus the value of inclusion, I think that still is a question that has to be addressed. Wow, very, very interesting. And, and again, it definitely is one of the themes that I've uh, come across talking with folks that Again, issues of the actual people you're talking about, the, beyond the, the technology, beyond the folks who are sort of ready there, right, ready to take it, whatever you give. What about all the folks who are still waiting outside? Precisely, yeah. right? So, I mean, if you're already serving clients, that's one thing. But yeah. if you actually need to look at expanding the market base, mm -hmm. Very different, very different calculations. Right, and especially interesting given that all of these entities do want to grow, they want to scale, they want to have more customers, they want to have more markets, and you have these markets that are there to be taken, <laughs> but you've got to go there. They haven't actually been sown yet, right? No right. one's prepped the field for them. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it is kind of a, an accessibility question, what's right. readily available, and then where do we want to grow a future market, and how do we address that? It's a very different question. It's baseline functionality in terms yeah. of product, versus, oh, because of your particular behavior and your circumstances and your risk profile, we'll give you these TNCs for the term of the, of the loan, or right. this is how we'll structure your deposit return. Mm -hmm. Like, why don't you get more deposits if that's what your problem is? <laughs> you know, like, just grow the base, but right. different questions, yeah. Right. Well, do, do you get a sense, before we move on to the next question, do you get a sense that folks are getting that at, at all yet, or is that still something that you're really feeling like you've got to uh, impress upon folks? I don't think it's a current business a uh, question that a lot of existing institutions are actually okay. considering. Yes, there are those that are worried about financial inclusion and working for that and actually looking at it. But for those up and running in the market, and especially challenger banks, mm -hmm. they're looking at people that can actually put their funds in. They're not necessarily looking at inclusion. So I think there's a divorce between what can I attack early on as mm -hmm. a new business right. versus how do I grow my how do I grow my base? Right. Or how do I grow my market? Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you mentioned challenger banks, and one of the other uh, things you were involved in was a power panel that was looking at challenger banking. Did this come up in that uh, conversation? Not particularly. Okay. Um, it did in the sense of, it's really the thesis is around, your culture starts to determine mm. what market you serve, and what right. market you serve then determines what your technology looks like. Mm. And your technology okay. then, then determines how personal or how the type of banking that you can actually deliver. Yeah. Mm. So it started from this, what are you and what do you want to be right. to who do you serve and then how do we serve them mm. and that's a very different way of looking at at it right yeah. so it starts with the question of who are we internally and who are we in terms of our values and principles and then everything else sort of rolls out accordingly so culture is being the linchpin or the 
the cornerstone for any foundation that you build. And whether or not you choose to attack a, a, a market that's been underserved. For example, Bank Novo looking at only SME clients. Okay. Um, and Insha, uh, building on top of Solaris Bank, are, are looking at um, Islamic banking clients in Europe. Mm -hmm. Right. So that determines how you go about structuring mm -hmm. everything else. It's the type of products you can deliver, but that determines your architecture. And then the architecture itself seems to be very um, similar in principle, which yeah. is microservices and yeah. modular. Yeah. So with that, how does that actually look in, in practice when you build is unique to the market that you choose to serve and mm. to the business models that you want to execute on. But the principle is open right. and microservice oriented. Your market, very different thing. It's based on how you want to address the market you serve and that goes again back to culture. So mm. in a sense, yes, if inclusion is part of the culture, then the principle is taken all the way through to the build and to the delivery of product. But if it's not part of the culture question, then it's not even married up. So I think there still is a divorce because we're not looking at specific culture as the origin point for everything else that's built and delivered. Right. Wow, that is interesting. Again, the, again, this theme of, of, of culture, the technologies, always enabling technologies, extremely important, but at the end of the day, and the beginning of the day, I should say, it's who are you? A priori of anything that you put to market, who are you, right. and what do you do? Right, right, fascinating. Um, uh, there have been some conversations about uh, Challenger Bakes this morning, I know, uh, on the main stage. Were there any other interesting insights out of that power panel from yesterday? I think really it came down to just that. It's okay. reducing it to its most essential components. Right. Who are you? What do you do? And how do you build to deliver on that value? Mm -hmm. That's it. And I think that's a universal theme. I think if we can identify that and then we start to unpick the different business models mm -hmm. and look at the potential success of, of the institutions that are challenging mm -hmm. the market. Right. Right. Interesting. One of the things I also wanted to talk to you about um, was something I, I caught, uh, I think it was an interview that you might have done not too long ago. And it was talking about, I think they were asking you uh, sort of what do you think might be coming in 2020, what's interesting, that kind of stuff. And uh, you provided an answer that I had not heard anyone talk about, which is why I wanted to bring it up with you. And that was the idea of what you called privacy tech. And um, it, once I heard it, it started just to make a little bit of sense. But I was thinking maybe if you could sort of flesh that idea out a little bit of what you mean by privacy tech and what do you think might be coming this year along those lines. Well, privacy is for the very first time encoded in, uh, as a human right, mm -hmm. right? So it's the first time in history we recognize privacy as an actual value. Right. And we're starting to understand the value of privacy in relation to the amount of data that each of us creates and the amount of insight that we produce or inference about who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, social media is one of the best examples of the petri dish gone haywire and the bacteria growing over the sides and out <laughs> into the lab. Um, that it's really now about containing and understanding how a to direct that information to the right people that we want to engage with services. And now that we have an existing customer data right in Europe and other jurisdictions, and for the very first time the U.S. has actually got CPA, yeah, uh, they've adopted, works. right, and 17 other states have other you know, privacy legislation in-house, mm -hmm. that we're starting to recognize this universally that privacy in relation to a customer data right and a customer actually owning the data yeah. and being putting the direction and distribution of that data in control of the actual individual or the entity, mm -hmm. that that's starting to take on a very commercial value. Mm -hmm. So now it's about finding the applicable solutions that can help frame that out, at least educate the customer in what they're doing, and then also put the right perimeters and guardrails around that. So who has permission and access to look at who you are, mm -hmm. that information, that really sensitive data that then gives them very, very profound inference about you. I still go back to the fact that Target was able to identify a young girl's pregnancy oh before she even knew and then alerted story. her father, right? <laughs> so it's that level of um, not big brother, but big brother-like mm. insight. Yeah. And that has a commercial value. It also has an inherent value for the individual. So what do you need to know in order to deliver a service? What do I need to know to be compliant that you are who you say you are in a KYC situation? All of that requires now a very different lens. And because it can actually be commercialized and right. has a, a market value, mm -hmm. we're going to see solutions coming along to do this. I think of identity. Mm -hmm. Like identity, let's be honest, nowadays everybody knows who everyone is. Anonymity is the ultimate goal again. Right. Like being able to actually have anonymity as you interact mm -hmm. in any field, be it in person to a certain extent, but also in the digital space. Yeah. Having that becomes an exceptional privilege and it will have a commercial value. Mm. So how do we start to put the tooth back, toothpaste back into the tube, right. but how do we start to put a little more framework around it? And then 
actually give people or reward people for sharing that data mm. and remunerate them for the inherent value they have as a, as a human being. It's an aspect, if you take it to its furthest, um, to the furthest degree in the argument, mm. it's a UBI. Each of us has an inherent yeah. value on the market. There's okay. a universal basic income based on our data. Right. And how do we start to acknowledge that, but also democratize it a little bit more mm -hmm. and then make it an inclusion effort as well. Yeah. So there are a number of different aspects that make this really interesting, from inclusion to a commercial exchange to recognizing the value and principle legally for the first time ever. And now it's starting to be recognized that corporates don't own this, they can't distribute it, they can't do this without explicit permission. Right. So how do we actually put the framework around that permission and the extent to which it's revealed, i.e. privacy, mm -hmm. the level of privacy. So I think that's going to be the next wave of things that we need to consider, certainly from a very esoteric and existential perspective, but in actual commercialization, this means we can make privacy a product. Right, right. Really interesting. It's, one of the things that it comes to mind hearing you talk about this is the idea that people are talking about with open banking and some of the different opportunities that people have. And it's, oh, but you, people don't necessarily know that they've got this issue with their data, that there are things that they can do, there's controls they can have. And I wonder if we were in a situation where uh, because the idea is, okay, how do you educate them? What is that process like? But then I think about, well, if you have a situation where you, uh, they're remunerated, where they're getting something for it, that that in and of itself might be something that could spur that education. Because now you're getting something. So why am I getting this? Exactly how does this work? Why am I? Oh, okay. Well, now that I'm getting a little bit of this, I want to look. And it seems like maybe that might be one of the mechanisms to help educate people about there are no, I, I think that that's an entirely different question with, like, and to be fair, sure, sure. don't have answers, but have ideas about market education or how do you actually enlighten people. I think the Cambridge Analytic, uh, Analytic mm. scandal was a first eye-opener of sorts. Yeah, big time. So I think we're going to see breaches that will actually serve much more to educate people around what their data is doing. Mm. Um, but when we're moving from open banking into open finance, so beyond payments into the actual credit side of things, right. and then looking at the long-term open data economy, mm. it's getting a lot more coverage. And I think people are starting to understand that that has impact across not just their finances, but their ability to travel and their utilities and their healthcare, that all of this will actually merge, you know, right. that this is becoming a, you know, one big world and it's one big world of data. And everything is moving towards the open data economy. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's not the assets that you can touch, feel, taste, and smell that right. become valuable. It is the intel and the information, the insight that becomes the economic engine. Mm -hmm. So when people start to understand that, I think that in itself, okay. they'll see more evidence. I think we can do a better job of educating the population. Certainly when I say open finance, people go whoosh, right? And for me, sometimes it's, it's even up here. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it, it's a slow education of the market, but we're seeing evidence of people starting to clue into data breaches and identity, um, identity theft. Those sort of things all start to factor in and eventually the big picture will be painted. But yeah, it's a, you know, we could do better. <laughs> sure. But I do think that will, that will come over right. time. All right. Interesting. Interesting. One thing I wanted to just ask about, maybe by way of, of wrapping up, um, is uh, Fintech Global, um, which is uh, the entity that you founded. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about that organization and the work that you do with them. So, Femtech was really about actually finding my own tribe and finding like-minded oh. people. Okay. Um, part of it was about the diversity question. Is that sure. you know I don't see a lot of diversity, and I think you can also understand that particular point of view. Sure. But it was really about the inclusion aspect. So how do we include, A, more people in the conversation of how to solve problems within the industry, mm -hmm. but also how do we start to include more people financially? Because mm. everything runs on money rails, right? Sure. Life runs on money rails. So how do we look at this? And it was a play on FinTech because it was an angle about women to start with. Um, but we're actually aligned with the women's economic imperative that okay. actually came out of the UN mandate uh, to look at huh. the broader picture of inclusion, but also women as an economic engine. Okay. And uh, we're doing some work with them in terms of helping policy and awareness and cross industry. It's really about the intersection of a number of things. Okay. And so moving into technology enabling the democratization of access and voice, mm -hmm. as well as, again, better data distribution so we can capitalize on that value. Mm -hmm. But it's really about how do we start to be fundamentally inclusive and how do we start to realign the way we deliver financial services that has ethics and morality mm -hmm. built into it, that is fair and competitive, but doesn't leave 
anyone behind because again, it's about the basic dignity of the human being, irrespective of gender, race, creed, color, orientation, right. ethnicity, any of that. Right. So in principle, that's exactly what it is. So the work is still out there and the chapters are still connected and it's really about creating sort of a global tribe with people that have this ideal in mind. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much for spending a little time talking with us. It's My really pleasure. great. Um, yeah. Talking about a lot of these different topics. Um, you're going to be uh, here all week. Are you going to be doing anything with uh, women in fintech or any of the other streams? Unfortunately, I have to go back to work. Oh, no. <laughs> So no, my days, my, and I will not be here the rest of the week, but okay. I have been here for the main content day. I'm sorry to miss most of the demos. I'll catch a couple of them this morning, but oh, I'm bummed. I don't get to see all of my favorite. <laughs> I love the speed dating of the demo. I love uh, it. I love the rapid. I love the pressure. I love the whole thing. And unfortunately, I'm going to miss a little bit of it. So That's too bad. Well, we certainly appreciate the time we've had with you here. Glad that you've been able to be here with us to join us. And thank you for joining us as well.